ancient Rome. This is fantastic. Pompeii. We're in Pompeii. And it's volcano day. I see the most terrible things. It has come. The box. The blue box. Prophecies of women are limited and dull. Only the men folk have the capacity for true perception. You have got to be kidding me. I demand you tell me who you are. We are awakening. Someone must make a choice. The most terrible choice. Falling. Welcome back, everyone. This is Discussing Who. I am Kyle Jones, and we are glad that you are here. Thanks for listening. Thanks for subscribing. And as always, please tell a friend, tell a co-worker, tell anyone you want to about this show. We would very much appreciate it. And who are we? Well, of course, that would be myself and Clarence Brown. Clarence, how are you? Yo, man. Yo, doing good. Doing good. Happy to be on another episode, dude. Well, How about yourself? Can't complain. Can't complain. Busy work day. This is recording day, day after Memorial Day in the mm. United States. So majority of us were off work yesterday. So Monday was a Monday and Tuesday rolled into one for work days. That was my day, but I'm glad to be here. I'll, I'll echo what you said. And also glad to have here with us Lee Shackelford. Lee. How are you? I'm well and uh, yeah, kind of suffering the same thing. I I didn't um I didn't do a lot of classwork with my students yesterday and so I've had to do it all today, didn't I? So, yeah. Mm. But um but it's good. It's good. Yes it is. Yes it is. Well, we're glad both of you are here with us and we are here. Why are we here? Of course, to talk about Why are we here? We, why are we here? Well, of course, we're here to talk about this little show that started in 1963 you may have heard of it called doctor who ever ever heard of that huh i don't know yeah i don't know I don't tell know. me more uh yeah. well there's this particular episode particularly in series four from 2008 it was mm-hmm. called the fires of pompeii you wouldn't by any chance have seen that would you yeah i remember that that was the 12th doctor adventure that had amy pond uh, yes, it was. Absolutely, it was. Glad you've seen it, because guess what? We're going to review it. Awesome. Cool. So, after we have finished being corny, I just have <laughs> one question. Do you have any news, Mr. Lee Shackleford? Uh, in the Doctor Who world, I guess um, the uh, the one that uh, will tickle most people uh, here in the southeastern United States, where the three of us are, is the advent of Dragon Con, which is the end of August, beginning of September in Hotlanta. And, uh, wow, David Tennant's going to be there. And so is Freema Adjaman. So... So I have a question for you guys, and I will preface by saying I have never been, but have either of you ever been to Dragon Con? The last time I was there was in the mid-80s, believe it or not, uh, late 80s. And people tell me that I got out just in time because it reached a, a surge in, a, in attendance. And people tell me that now you you just, if you don't mind being squashed by crowds, then you'll have a great time. I do not particularly like being squashed by crowds, so I'm I'm glad I. But yeah, it's been thirty years. My wow. God. Yeah. Uh, so, Clarence, what about you? Have you been? Uh, no, I have not. No, I have not, man. So I will say this: the concept of crowds, you know, they're okay, but. I don't know if I would want to be squashed. I'm I'm not all in the squash feeling. Well, I'll tell you another of um, another of my my friends, uh, the uh, uh, fantasy writer who writes under the name Davis Ashura. uh, He is going to be there. He's also a guest, and uh, he was there last year. And he told me that it was not it was not terrible. Ah, cool. Uh, but yeah, it, it, folks interested in this, uh, yeah, the Tenth Doctor and uh, uh, Martha Jones will be there. Um, but you know, as long as I brought it up, also look for uh, Davis Ashura. That, that last name is spelled A S H U R A. Author of the award-winning Asian Indian trilogy called The Cast and the Outcasts and the Young Adult Epic Fantasy: The Chronicles of William Wilde. But um, but yeah, he and about ten thousand other people will be there. 
Cool. Uh, August, I'm going to tell you right here, August 29th to September the 2nd. Yeah, yeah, and it, it also isn't exactly uh, for cheap. <laughs> it's, you know, no. you have to get a membership to go, and it's like 125 bucks. Well, that's right, and that's yeah. how they get a listers like like David yeah. Bleeding Tenet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Considering the fact, and this is a shout out, and I know we shout out to this particular group a lot on this show, but a particular good shout out to Alan Seiler and the groups from Hulanta. That was my very ex- first experience with any kind of con, mm-hmm. zip, any, any convention. And wow. that was a freaking awesome experience to go and have, you know, a Doctor Who convention and a nice Doctor Who convention as my first experience. So kudos Who, to those guys. Yeah. Hulanta was a good size. It really was. Yes, yeah. it was. Yes, it was. But... Back to a little bit further in the past than Hulanta, specifically back to around 79 AD. If you guys don't have any other things on your plates that you'd like to talk about, why don't we go ahead and get into the actual review? Why not? Cool beans. For anyone listening, if you have not seen The Fires of Pompeii, put us on pause. Go watch the episode. Come back. Because from this moment forward, spoilers. 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 The spoiler warning has gone out, and we are back to review The Fires of Pompeii. It is the second episode of the 2008 series of Doctor Who. It stars David Tennant as the Tenth Doctor and Catherine Tate as Donna Noble. This episode first aired on the 12th of April 2008 on the BBC. This episode is notable for hosting guest stars such as Peter Capaldi and Karen Gillan before they, of course, return, as Lee said, as the 12th Doctor and Amy Pine. So, summary view. Summary view. Clarence, well, what do you think of this episode? I um, I know I say this a lot, but I had fun with it. I thought it was a hard episode for so many reasons, uh, as we will talk about, but the the unfolding of what happens and how the doctor is intricately involved in what happens uh, turns out to be a heartbreaker. And, um, you know, we have Donna holding him to task, which she does so well. So, <laughs> you know, uh, I thought it was a well played out story. I said fun, but it wasn't exactly fun, was it? Um, yeah, it's, I, it's got fun I, moments. It's, yeah, you know. uh, yeah, I think Peter Capaldi did a excellent audition for Doctor in this episode. So, uh, yeah, uh, I, I, I loved it, man. All right, good deal, Lee. What about you? Yeah, I'd say very much the same. It's it has some um, some plot holes and some character inconsistencies that I I remember finding troubling the last time I saw it, and and they they bugged me again this time. But uh, it's still. I, I love the the Doctor Who's, you know, going back to 1963. I, I love whenever they they find themselves in the midst of historic events. So going to Pompeii uh, on the on that fatal day, that's that's exciting just in and of itself. So I really enjoy that, and they have a lot of fun with the, the language in this, and I, I really appreciate that. That's my favorite thing in the episode is them the jokes in Latin and things like that. So. What about you? You know, this is not one of the ones that I go back and watch. And I didn't realize until watching it today, I've not seen this since Peter Capaldi was named as the 12th Doctor. So this was an interesting take for me going back and seeing, you know, Amy, seeing, you know, the 12th Doctor. I'm curious, though, um, because that kind of caught my attention when you said the inconsistencies in characterization. Do you want to elaborate on that? Because that actually, you know, like I said, caught my curiosity. We, we talked about the challenge of kind of making Donna smarter than the character as introduced in The Runaway Bride. And because she she's just the way she's depicted in that story. She's just somebody who knows that there is a larger world out there, but she just doesn't care. And she knows a lot about uh, Roman history here. She, she knows 
she, I don't know, she, she, she grasps things quickly and readily. And I know that's a story convenience, but I, but it just made me think, who is this? Because that's not Donna. <laughs> yeah, she um, speaks Latin too. Yeah. Hmm. You, yeah. <laughs> so how about so, I disagree with you? You know, yeah, please. Here's my thought, because what I find interesting in what you just said uh, in regards to the character, because I've done a lot of thinking about Donna, because I've said on this show before, her first appearance, I didn't like her. The second appearance and in this series, you know, I, I grew to love this character. And I made a comment, I think, on our last recording for Partners in Crime that I said that something to the effect that this was not two different Donnas, but it was just we get to see another side of Donna. And when when I see Donna, I see the time that she spent after meeting the doctor, she has this experience. She's mm-hmm. exposed to this different point of view. And I'm not saying she wasn't what she was in Runaway Bride. She totally, in my opinion, was what she was. But that experience and not having the doctor around her and trying to find the doctor or whatever, I think that experience changed her to the point to where she did try to learn more and she did try to do this and she did try to do that. I just think that it was a progression of her character because of meeting the doctor. Well, it's the only explanation for her character that makes sense. You know? mm-hmm. So I, I, I think you have to be right. She, uh, I, when, when, when the doctor says, we're not in Rome, we're in, we're in Pompeii. I thought, and then Donna's going to say, what's that? You know, mm-hmm. but yeah. no, she, she, she knows, she knows exactly what he means. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and she understands the significance of it. And I thought, well, she, <laughs> yeah, she bought, she bought a book between then and now. Um, so, you know, I, so, so maybe you're right, you know, and, and, and once we meet Wilf too, we understand that, that he is all about understanding the larger perspective of things. He is literally looking out at the universe. So, you know. And she loves him, so yeah, why not? Why not? What about you, Clarence? I'll buy it. What, what do you think? Am I right? Lee, is Lee right? Who's right? Be the be, uh, be the tiebreaker here. But, but I'm agreeing with you now. So. Oh yeah, that's well, true. I don't, I don't I don't know who's right or wrong, but uh, I I don't know. I I don't feel like her portrayal in this episode was overly smart. I do think some of the things mentioned are things that are that you kind of know of. Not intimately, but you know, you know what Pompeii is. You may not know all the details and the time frame and all that stuff. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I don't know. It's kind of hard to frame it. Well, uh, well how about this? If you don't, you think that the Donna that we met in the Runaway Bride, once she's been told that we are in Pompeii and this is the day before Vesuvius erupts, wouldn't she say, "Okay, let's get back in the TARDIS. We're <laughs> we're out of here." Yeah, yeah, yeah. I kind of agree with that. Yeah, yeah. I, I have to agree with that too as well. But but then the story would be over, and <laughs> we don't want that. <laughs> well, well, in this episode, she very much played the role of uh, moral compass uh, or moral center for the doctor, and I, I actually loved her being um, kind of the voice for saving the people in this episode. Wow. She's yeah. and she's willing to die for it. Yeah, it's yeah, it's pretty fantastic. Yeah, and you're right; that is who she is by the end of Runaway Bride. I mean, she she is the one who stops him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I had forgotten that, but you're right. She is. She did stop him, or at least attempted to stop him with the arachnos. Yeah, but she says that's enough. <laughs> yeah. So it's interesting. This is a fixed moment. Speaking of Pompeii, and they, they arriving in Pompeii, thinking that they were in Rome. And it brought up an interesting question, and and I'll pose this to either of you. You know, they arrived the day before. Do you think it would have been possible for the TARDIS to have even landed on Volcano Day? Mm. Hmm. Well, we we have uh, Neil Gaiman's explanation that the TARDIS has always taken him where he needs to be for whatever reason. True. You know, I just found that, you know, Mm. interesting idea and, and it harkens back to what you just said about game and saying i don't take you where you want to go i take you where you need to go 
And, you know, I just thought, it, would it even be possible, regardless of the ship or the TARDIS being sentient, that you could literally materialize the next day and you go outside and there's ash, you know, or... Mm-hmm. Is there some type of safety protocol that goes on that says, oh, no, you can't go this day. You've got to at least go back 24 hours because you couldn't be sustained, (laughs) you know, a day from now. Yeah, well, well, it's funny because um, the doctor makes this statement saying of how he sees time differently. Um, He can see the fixed points in time, but yet and still he finds himself here right before this massive event You know, it it just seems funny to me that sometimes that we know the (laughs) doctor is so incredibly smart and fascinating, but yet and still we're here (laughs) at this event. But I guess he had to be here. So I don't know. But yeah, but then why if there's nothing he can do about it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that that probably is one of the the plot holes of this is. Yeah. (laughs) But does it not, in effect, create a bigger narrative or add, not necessarily create, but add to a you know, a bigger or larger narrative this concept of fixed moments and what you can and what you cannot do, because we will see later in the waters of Mars some of the ramifications of what happens when the doctor goes against meddling with a fixed moment. Yeah. Well, yeah, and you're reminding me, too, that what we learn as this story goes along is that if he's there for a reason, it's because the power of aliens are going to do something else that Vesuvius yep. isn't going to erupt. The The answer to the problem with the power of aliens is to blow up the mountain. Correct again. So, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking that the Doctor and Donna just find themselves in the course of events that they can't alter. But the, but the, the heartbreaker is they have to alter the events. Yeah. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Or is it, do they alter the events or do they maintain the events? Because yes. history is, and it's similar to Rosa in a sense of, but but it's similar, but the reverse. And mm. it is in this episode, their action that maintains history, whereas in Rosa, it was their inaction that maintained history. Mm, yeah. You know. Yeah. It's a deliberate inaction, but yeah. Yeah, that's right. I mean, yeah, that. That they, they have to make the history happen. So, yeah. You know, we, we have arrived. We're, you know, let's go back to our arrival. We even mentioned the TARDIS uh, translation circuits, not necessarily the translation matrix as it's later referred. But still, you know, the fact that this TARDIS can translate, it's, that's mentioned again. And it also gives uh, Donna a interesting speaking Latin, which they says is uh, they think is Welsh. Yeah, yeah, that was good. <laughs> well, they they the Romans hear it as Welsh w- uh, when they try to speak Latin. And I think that's 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 one of the jokes that I really <laughs> I think enjoyed. So. Was that an end joke? <laughs> and, uh, uh, yes. Oh, yeah, definitely. I think <laughs> the show being shot in in Cardiff and so on. But um, which is the, and, and the Welsh language is it is like nothing on earth. But but yeah. So the doctor, I think he's playing with them, but that he he keeps deliberately using Latin phrases that we use today as part of English. And every time somebody has to you know blink and say I, I don't know what you're talking because they never heard his Welsh. Yeah, that was clever writing. He tells him he, sh- he uh, that's just a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. He t- tells uh, Cecilius that he shouldn't have bought this uh, this wooden box. Speaking of the wooden box, you know, Lee, I have a quick question for you. Have we ever in the classic series had the the TARDIS be sold off? Sold off. Um, Nicole would know. Um, (laughs) I don't know. Um, Nicole would know. Uh, I I, it certainly has been hauled off and dragged away and things like that. Uh, I don't know. Interesting. Interesting. So I have a curious question, Clarence. I'm going to pose this one to you. This Sibylline sure. sisterhood, what were your thoughts on them initially? Uh, they remind me of the, what's the other sisterhood of Doctor Who? I should the, look, sisterhood look of the sisterhood of Karn. Yes. yes, that's who they reminded me of a lot. And yes, yeah. I, I thought they were going to play into that somehow, but but obviously they didn't. Uh, but But yeah, they reminded me of them a lot. I thought it was interesting how they communicate with the 
the eye hands or the eyes drawn on the hands. I thought that was fun. Uh, but yeah, I, I thought uh, they were pretty interesting. And I was wondering when the doctor was referring to, um, oh, what's her name? What's the head sister name? Sybil, that he knew. Yes. Um, do they name her? Well, he, I think he said Sybil. Uh, they said Sybil, but Sybil is a famous prophet from uh, earlier times. So he's, uh, they're, they're the sisterhood of Sybil, but, but uh-huh. Sybil isn't there. Sybil would have been in their path. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. Huh. Yeah. He, and he, it goes by very fast, but he makes a great joke about the fact that Sybil could see the future because he said, I think she rather fancied me, you know, but I said, Oh, it's not going to end well. And she said, no, it is. I said, well, you'd know. So, <laughs> <laughs> You know, Clarence, you brought up a good point because I didn't remember the name of them whenever I watched them, but I remember that there was a sisterhood from the classic. And you're right. I thought that this was going to be the return of the sisterhood of Karm because they really, you know, the look of them looked a lot like them. Then when you mm-hmm. had the main sister or the head of of the of them behind a veil but and now yeah. we you know know why <laughs> but my first thought was is this another time lord that we're bringing back specifically a time lady named the Ronnie because i was thinking oh well we brought back the master in series 3 mm, are we bringing back the Ronnie in series 4 but alas that didn't happen <laughs> so lee what about you what did you think of them and their motivation Oh, well, well, you know, uh, Brain of Morbius is my favorite serial of the classic series. So, of course, they these people reminded me of the sister of Karn, uh, who we did see again, if you've seen the episode, uh, uh, The Night of the Doctor, right? Is that what it's right. called? That is correct. And I, 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 yeah, I'm with you. I just love the eyes on the back hands uh, and Donna's quip about that. You may have eyes on the back of your hands, but you can can have eyes in the back of your head. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they are, um, she gets, she gets a lot of good lines in, in this show. They, they, that yes, it's, indeed. It's like, I think they wrote this one really for Catherine Tate. So yeah, lots of fun. And the, and the, the very idea of this, um, this religious cult that is, that accepts the fact that, that they're being able to, the, the price of being able to see the future is that it's literally turning them to stone slowly in Agonizing slowness is uh, is just one of the most horrifying ideas, and in, in who it's just yeah yeah, yeah and it's it's kind of awesome. Of we eventually learn that they get their you know their ability to see the future from the, the time rift a rift in time from when the crash happened, uh, and it it, it uh, broke a rift in time. I thought that was a good explanation of how they could see the future. I thought that was pretty mm-hmm. cool. Yeah. And that, yeah, yeah. and that ties into a yeah. comment that I was going to make, which is when you look back and you see people of earlier times, I'm not going to say prehistoric or pre whatever, but earlier times. And we, I think we even mentioned this somewhat in the witch finder, but it's interesting how our perception of things, their perception of things are completely different. Like, Yes, there was a rift in time, and yes, it did give them perception. But, you know, they're talking about household gods, and they're, you, you can't even do this without, oh, pray to the household gods. Whereas our understanding of stuff is so different from, from what it was in, you know, first century AD. Yeah. And, uh, Mm -hmm. and for, for me, like one of the, my favorite moments of the entire episode is when, uh, the daughter, and also I forget the the guy who came over who was making the circuits. Um, Lucius Petrus Dexter. Him. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, when he came to Cacula's house, house and Cassilia's house, and was was um, actually her uh, the daughter along with him were telling the doctor and Donna, you know who they were. You know, I thought that was fantastic and. You know, put them on their toes for just a moment to be like, you know, how is this actually happening? <laughs> and like the look on Donna's face, you know, London or whatever they called her. Uh, just that was just good fun there. And, you know, uh, I love the comment about, 
you know, the sister saying that the doctor or the daughter, excuse me, saying that the doctor wasn't even his real name. He was he was hiding behind that. Mm, yes. so, so all of that was great it's, for me. His name is hidden. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. it's that it's that Doctor Who versus religion thing again, too, that the doctor kind of flying into the scene and they say, oh, we, you know, well, well, she's part of the priesthood of so and so and she can see the future. And he's like, uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, of course you can. And then they start <laughs> talking about, it, you know, he's not even from this planet, you know. Yeah. Uh, hello. <laughs> yeah. Hey, wait a minute. These people actually can do it. Oh, OK. Yeah, that was great. <laughs> but but isn't that what we need every once in a while as a viewer is someone who comes along, whether it be a companion or whether it be a guest on the particular episode and, you know, another character that puts the doctor in his place? Yes, yeah, absolutely. You know, and I think that that is what in this episode made me really you know, just say, oh, I really like Donna, was she put him in his place over and over and over again. You know, even like in the very beginning, when he's talking about, I, I can't do anything, it's a fixed moment. She says, I might just have something to say about that spaceman. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So let's transition for a moment and let's actually <laughs> talk for a moment about the aliens, you know, I, w I won't necessarily say that they were the bad guys, even though they were sort of bad. Um, they are aliens, the Pyroville. Them as a whole, Lee, what, I'll let you take this one. Them as a whole, what did you think of the Pyroville? I think I, I was watching this episode this time with my producer hat on and thinking about how expensive this episode must have been. Yeah. <laughs> because... It's not just a period piece, and that's always expensive. But for God's sake, we 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 Vesuvius erupted, and <laughs> and buried Pompeii, and it all happens on camera. And you have these monstrous CG villains who've got fire inside them, and uh, the whole that whole spectacular thing inside the the mountain. It's just yeah. Uh, I, I would like to know, just budget-wise, if this was the most <laughs> expensive episode of New Who. Um, I, you know, now that's probably the end of this season. That's what actually. you say. That would yeah. probably because, be. yeah, the, the 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 episodes at the end of the season not only have all that amazing outer space stuff, but you also have the, an expensive cast. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, woo. So, Clarence, what about you? What What did you think of the Pyro V? I thought they were very well done. Um, I do like the look of them. I, I thought it looked, even by today's standard, looked pretty freaking good. Um, I thought they were interesting. I'm still trying to decipher their purpose, which I guess is just to live on <laughs> and, and, and destroy the planet. Uh, I think that's what the doctor kind of says is one step too far. Um but I don't know. I, I thought they were pretty, pretty decent as a villain. What did you think? Mm. You know, I, I kind of agree with you and the look of them. And I've over the years wondered, OK, what do they look like? And I think the character that I'm w looking for here is Megatron from the Transformers cartoon. Mm. There's something about the head of one of the mm -hmm. guys when he's looking up. It reminds me of a burning Megatron. So, hmm. Well, they're, they're, the silhouette of their head, to me, looked like a, a Roman centurion's helmet, which I, I felt sure is deliberate. But I don't know why they would look like they had centurion helmets on. But, <laughs> 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 I mean, do, do we do we get the idea of centurion helmets from looking at them? or was it, um, <laughs> Maybe so. Maybe so. Who knows? Um, one thing that I found uh, very interesting was the whole concept of these humans getting it, the ones that are having these visions. They're slowly turning to stone. And I don't know if I got a clear understanding of why. I mean, I get that, the, that and it may have been, I may be answering my own question. Was it the breathing of the fumes that was turning them to stone or was it something mm. else? No, that's what I. That's how I read that. Yeah, I think because because the Pyroval are rock people. When they crashed, they all melted, and they're trying to reconstitute themselves inside of the the uh, the people. 
It's kind of what I'm getting from breathing in these vapors, the rocks, as the doctor said. Ah, so it's actually mm-hmm. the, the 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 aliens themselves. That's this this the, that's this scaling, not necessarily them turning into ash. That's what I think, but I mm. could totally be wrong. Mm, I like it though. And you know what? I think you're right, and I'll tell you why. At one point, the main sister or the lead of the sisterhood, the doctor calls forth whoever it is that's actually inhabiting. So that would, if if her entire body had been transformed and she then speaks in a different tone, I th- Clarence, I think you're right. Hmm. Yeah, that was a different voice. That's right. Hmm. Hmm. Kudos to you. That I, hmm. I think you're right. You know, I'm still thinking about the sisterhood, and I was thinking, you know, Karen Gillan looks good painted, stark white like that, and it makes me wonder, <laughs> what would what would she look like if you painted her blue? Uh, are you talking about Sister Anatomy? Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, you know, spelled since they didn't name her, I figured, hey, she needs a name, so she's going to be Sister N O T A M Y, not to me, not to me. Yeah. She's not Amy. She's Sister Notomy. Sister Notomy. I don't know. Um, so yeah, I just need their uh, naming yes, people. Uh, uh, I think they've all got names. I don't know. <laughs> uh, anyway. anyway. But let's paint her blue anyway, just to see what that would look like. I, I, you have to think of these things. Yeah. Just, just out of curiosity to see what she'd look like if she was. But if you do paint her blue, she does need like to have a pink uh, section in the top of her head. And bald. <laughs> Sometimes. And bald. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so let's go to the choice for a moment. We met, we referenced mm. this earlier in our conversation. What about the choice that d- the doctor and Donna had of either allowing the Pyrovilles to basically destroy the Earth or to let the R2 act and, and allow the mountain to erupt as a volcano and kill thousands of people what were you what what did you including them including (laughs) them at the point yes Mm. Uh, again like i think it was all set up beautifully because from the early moments of the episode once we find out where they are and what's going to happen donna wants the doctor to save these people i mean she is on a mission to get him to help these folks this is what you do doctor this is what you do but, you know, of course, the doctor says, no, this is a fixed point in time. And then they have the realization that they're the ones that's going to cause it. So, you know, I, I just feel like the setup paid off well by the end of this episode. And especially when we get to the very end, um, I think it, they just set everything up pretty well up to this point. Cool. Lee, what about you? Yeah, this is as far as Donna goes, this is the thing that bothered me the most. And it's. It, maybe it's not about writing her character so much as plotting the episode, because if anything, the the character we met in The Runaway Bride is fantastically self-absorbed. And this episode asks <laughs> her to be willing to die for yeah. a lot of people she doesn't know. Yeah. And I, I kind of think it, it all happens so fast that to me it strains credibility that she doesn't say, oh, you know what? It's not too late for us to just go get back in the TARDIS and get, get out of here. Yeah. Um, I, hmm. I get that. I but get she's, that. But she's ready to do it. But I, I think it's just because it all has to happen so fast. But she decides to trust him. Hmm. And, and and it's huge. But but it does it does happen awfully fast. <laughs> so, so, so let me ask you a question. What if the next episode, which is the Planet of the Ood, I believe is the name of the title. I mean, the of the episode. Mm-hmm. So what if that story, which, you know, sees the doctor more in control and Donna as an observer and a very great observer, but still she takes mm-hmm. less of an active role than she does in this particular episode if that one had come prior and she had experienced the planet of the Ood, would this then have made for your continuity mm. that you're referring to and the character development, would that have slotted a little more sense to you? Mm-hmm. Maybe so. 
I don't know. I haven't seen Planet of the Ud in a long time, so I'm going to watch it this week. But so revisit, yeah, so I, I, make notes, yeah. and and, and yeah. think of that while you're watching. And here's the reason I asked question. that question. <laughs> I read while doing research for this episode that originally Planet of the Ood was slotted to air before this. And it was decided that Planet of the Ood was too dark uh, to <laughs> air as the second episode out of the gate. So they moved it back and then put this before it. Amazing. Amazing. So, so curious yeah. from your perspective of, you know, the lack of her development, if it would have aired as it originally perhaps was conceived, then mm. if that other episode had have actually come second and her experiencing that, could you then put her in a different mindset going into this episode? Yeah. Yeah. I wonder. Because they never, if you think about it, they never say out the door of this episode, we assume this is her first trip, but they never say, welcome to your first trip, Donna. Uh, or do they? Well, do they? Hmm. Now I have this, to go back and check myself. Yeah, Seems like he gives her an official welcome by the end, if I'm remembering correctly. Yeah. Yeah, he do. you are correct. You are that's correct. That's right. That's that's what I'm thinking of, yeah. And, um, and, and maybe they did change it, and, you know, maybe that was just in the production, and maybe when they shot it, they, they, they did that. I just know that the concept oh. of the story... So maybe I'm wrong there. Maybe I'm ad libbing, but I do know the concept of Planet of the Ood was originally supposed to be before Fires of Pompeii. Mm. All right. So we do see. Let's move on here. We do see that they do indeed uh, make their choice, and they actually are in an escape pod, which of course they have to survive, which they do. And then Donna is walking through a ash-filled city street trying to save a child, trying to save anyone. And then the Donna goes and demands to the doctor, just someone, please, not the whole town, just someone. So Clarence, I'll let you take this one first. What did you think of that interaction between Donna and the doctor? I mean, I think she's been earning it the whole episode. She's been earning that moment. Uh, I do like where we see that it balances the doctor a little bit and he does give in. Um, and also we see like, I, I feel that we see some development from uh, the sister as well as the brother in the, especially the brother in this episode, he goes on an adventure with the doctor. <laughs> so uh, it, it, it grounds us to those characters and it makes us love them even more. And like by the end, you know, we just want him to go and save them and he does it in rather spectacular fashion. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I love their bit of that about you guys. Cool. Lee? Yeah, when we get around to talking about favorite scenes, this is, in fact, my favorite scene. It's her th- it, back in the TARDIS. Safe. They can, they can go. Yeah. But she says, but sh- she's not having it. It's a great performance from Catherine Tate, too. I, I believe it completely. Yeah. So as far as the believability, yes, I agree with you. And the the whole concept, and I really, th- well, the whole concept of you just walk by four people as, yes, you walk by many before the four people, but there were four people in this house alone that you just walk by in order to get back into the TARDIS. Yeah. And if, I mean, really and truly, I mean, if the turn left had have happened here, the concept of the doctor saying, no, I'm not saving anyone. I really think as a character, Donna would have said, take me home at mm. this point. Mm. But, you know, because the, there, there was just a level I would have said of cruelty. And maybe you could say the same thing, you know, not for specifically you two, but maybe someone could say the same thing about leaving all the other people and I understand that that oh. had to happen, mm-hmm. but there's a level of cruelty when you've got that person right next to you and you don't do anything. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think there has to be a certain amount of black and uh, of gray area um, with the doctor in certain times. You know, it can't always just be black and white. And uh, are we probably breaking the timeline or is this how the timeline should have been anyway by helping them? 
who knows? Uh, but, uh, you know, again, you mentioned him walking about by the family to see them all cuddled <laughs> on the ground, just hugging each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He had to go back. He had to go back. Yeah. So let's talk favorite scenes since, uh, Lee mentioned that this was his favorite scene and you may have already said it, but Lee, if you would like to say why this was your favorite scene, why was it? I love it as a, as an emotional performance. Uh, from both of them. Um, uh, David Tennant doesn't get so uh, so much to say, but he is the one in the moment of anguish. He's already said no, and he's told her why it has to be no, but she persuades him anyway. And I just think that's tremendously powerful. It's it's an amazing, amazing scene. Um, cool. Clarence, what was your favorite scene? Um, I love the one where they're telling the doctor all about them and they, they have no idea how they know this information. So I, that, that probably was my favorite. But also we have to talk about the um, uh, the moment Donna says, you know, um, she, she's willing to sacrifice herself. I think that's pr- a pretty major moment as well. Oh, indeed it is. What about you, man? All right. So for me, my favorite scene is a t- Just one segment of the scene where the doctor opens the TARDIS and says, uh, come with me. And it is the point to where, you know, the doctor reaches down and takes the father's arm and and they, you know, grasp arms and he's helping them up. And that moment of contact and for some reason, just literally, as I was watching it yesterday, gave me chills. And the reason for that was that to me was the moment that the doctor put in the back of his memory that face. Mm-hmm. And you know, we see, <laughs> seriously, yeah, we really? see in, really? in series nine where that comes back. But that really? to me, as I'm picturing myself as the doctor looking down at really? this character and holding and, and I'm saying you're imprinting your, this. Really? On you. Yes. What about when he's on Torchwood? But, but they never referred to why <laughs> he know. was on, you know, tor- Torchwood. <laughs> Um, yeah. I'm, I'm just messing. <laughs> uh, no, and I would say that's a that's a great um, reverse engineering or a you know, great retcon of what's going on here. But uh, but the truth is uh, they addressed it in the show. So the twelfth Doctor does say, "Why, why did I choose this face right. of, of all the faces I've seen?" And yeah, so uh, this is the moment. I- mm. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's wild. Yeah, it's yeah. wild yeah. because you see Donna. I mean, they actually show Donna. You know, saying, you know, save one person. And that's when the doctor professes, you know, that's, you know, I'm, I'm the doctor and I, and I save people. Mm-hmm. Save yourself, doc. Save yeah. yourself. Yeah. Yep. He also How thinks, selfish are you? He <laughs> also thinks about that priestess and he thinks, boy, if I ever see anybody like her, I'm going <laughs> to. No, he doesn't. Uh, let her hop aboard. <laughs> yeah. So, I'm yeah, going I, to the, marry her daughter. Exactly. The the I thought they did a nice job of making David Tennant look angelic almost in that moment. Mm-hmm. You know, we didn't see mm-hmm. the interior of the TARDIS. We just saw like blaring lights from behind him as if he was floating like an angel or something. So I thought they looked really fantastic. Mm. And once again, another reference to the doctor looking as, you know, religiously looking or looking a la something of a religious being. Well, he, he does become religious by the end of the episode, right? He does. <laughs> yes. He does indeed, yeah. But, but it isn't played for laughs as in uh, Voyage of the Damned. So. so let me ask you guys, we've talked about our favorite scene. Favorite quote. Did you have a favorite quote? And at least since, I mean, since I started with Lee last time, Clarence, why don't you go first? Did you have a favorite quote? <clears throat> Nothing can survive it. Certainly not us. Never mind us. Right. Yeah. Deep. <laughs> Lee, what about you? Uh, it's hard to pick because I love all the times that somebody speaks Latin and the other <laughs> people hear it as being Welsh. Um, the doctor says, uh, we who are about to die salute you. He says, moratori te salutant. And Lucius says, Celtic prayers won't help you now. <laughs> But, but my favorite of all the Latin jokes is when they're groping for a, a cover name. He can't say John Smith. So mm-hmm. uh, Cecilia says, who are you? And the doctor says, well, I'm Spartacus. <laughs> and Donna immediately says, and so am I, which is a reference to the film Spartacus. It, it's another one of those things you think, would she know that or is that an accident? But <laughs> but it's a 
I could explain it, but it's a major plot spoiler for the for the for the film Spartacus. But all of us who know that film, you know, you gotta laugh. <laughs> I'm Spartacus, and so am I. <laughs> oh, Mrs. and Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. Spartacus. No, never, 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 <laughs> never, never. <laughs> so for me, my favorite quote was, "You were right. Sometimes I need someone." Welcome yeah. aboard. Welcome aboard. Welcome yeah. aboard. All right. So, guys, we've gone over our favorite scene. We've gone over our favorite quote. So before we get into our final rating, our final review, are there any other points of the plot or this episode that you had written down that you would like to cover that we haven't missed? Yes, I have two things really quick. I don't get the clothes. David Tennant is walking around in a suit the whole time. And Donna, up until she changed into the, uh, uh, I think they call it a toga, whatever she was wearing by the end. (laughs) Um, you know, they were like wearing regular clothes. They looked very out of place. And I thought they were going to take that moment to say maybe that the TARDIS had a, um, like it has a language translation, maybe it had a filter around their clothing or something. It would have been a good time for that, but they didn't. And um, I don't know. It just felt weird to me. <laughs> and they also, did, they did at least try to address it. I mean, yeah, yeah, they did. They did. But, but it gets dismissed. And also, in, may, in a super ultra ultra cheesy line after Capaldi has had this excellent performance in this episode they gave him this cheesy line about the volcano uh at this it uh, I didn't like it mm. I didn't like it it um, is pretty awful it the is. Vulcan god is must be enraged it volcano yeah <laughs> <laughs> and, and that really is when and where the word came into existence but but ouch yeah, it's, no. Uh, <laughs> maybe, the, may, maybe uh, you know the character. I can't say his name. You, you guys know I'm not good with names, but maybe the Cassilius? character. Uh, thank you. Was so like disgruntled that he had to say that. That's why the first series of Capaldi's Doctor. He was so grumpy. <laughs> Oh, 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 another good point. Oh, don't I have me crack it up. <laughs> so you made the statement, uh, I don't know what kind of kids you've been flying around in, with in space, but you're not telling me to shut up. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm not laughing because she wasn't having it. No. <laughs> okay, so let me, here's another Donna moment. Let me jump in real quick before um, before we give it over to Lee. When Donna is kidnapped, she tells the sisterhood, which normally, you know, this is the point where the companion is screaming and wait, waiting for the doctor to come. Donna says, you might have hand, eyes on the back of your hands, but you'll have eyes in the back of your ha- head whenever I finish with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah I did love that. And the same scene, the doctor sort of wins that whole debate, though, because the priestess says, you know, we're, we're, we're going to... S- Still your prattling voice forever. And the doctor says, oh, that'll be the day. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Oh, that's funny. Boom. So what about you, Lee? Did you have any um, points that we haven't covered? No, I think we've covered it. I'm I'm glad, uh, Clarence, you reminded me of uh, the volcano thing because that is is, uh, painful. It's Oh, 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 real real quick. What did you guys think about the water gun? Oh, I love the water gun. (laughs) That is lovely. Yeah. Yeah. Donna says, you, you shot her with a water gun. I flip and love you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> oh, man. All right. So I'm going to start out our uh, review. I'm, I'm, you know, I know I normally go with you guys first, but I'm going to start out our review because I can't remember the last time when we have been going over at the end that we are like, each of us going, oh, 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 no, oh, 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 yeah, we want to say this. So that <laughs> yeah. has to say there was something good about this episode. And because of that, and because of at the end of the episode, Donna Noble has been saved. I'm going to give it a 4.75. Nice. All right. Lee Shackelford, what say you? I'm going to give it a, a, a solid four. Um, the, the things about it that bug me are, are pretty deep. Uh, but, um, but golly, I love the, the jokes about Latin and Welsh and, <laughs> um, and, and the character names and so on. And just the simple fact that they're in, uh, in Pompeii and my goodness, the, that whole sequence and effect of that, that awful event is so well executed. It's just, it's just chilling as it should be. Um, so, you know, that's, so that's where I am. What about you, Clarence? I think I'm going to give it a 4.3. 
And um, I think it's very ambitious, like you mentioned before, Lee. They do some pretty big things as far as um, production in this episode. And I thought it still holds up fairly well. I I also love seeing some of our other Doctor Who folk in this episode. And, And ultimately, I just thought Donna, though maybe out of character so soon, you know, Maybe she should have been at this point by the end of the season, not at the beginning. Mm. I, I, I do like her in this episode, and I kind of forget what happened before because I liked her so much uh, in this episode. So, um, And I like her being the moral compass for the Doctor and trying to ground him a little bit. So, yeah, I, I had a lot of fun with this episode. And, yeah, yeah, 4.3. Before we go into our closing, I want to mention one other thing that I have never picked up in my previous watching until watching it this time, one of the prophecies that they give is she is returning. And I know that in a later prophecy we hear it is returning, but I never realized that there was a she is returning Mm. until watching it last night. So I thought that that was really cool. Yeah, there's a couple of nice um, uh, breadcrumbs pointing us towards the end of this series. More spoilers. Um, the, the reason why the pirate veils are there is because their planet's been destroyed. All right. Or taken away. Or it's or gone. Something. Right. It's gone. So stuff like that, yeah. Yeah, and there was the reference to Donna having something on her back. Oh, yes. I forgot about that. Yes. yes. So, say 4.75, I'm just telling you. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but you know what, Lee Shackelford, you can tell... Everyone, not just me, not just Clarence, but everyone, where else might people find you on the Internet? Oh, there's so many places, but look for me at the Relativity Podcast at RelativityPodcast.com. Cool. Clarence Brown, what about you? Boop, boop, boop. Uh, I don't have anything to plug. Uh, no recent episodes or <laughs> anything else, but I will say um, uh, one of my favorite podcasters, Jeff Kanata, always gives his parting gift. And his words are usually at the end of the episode, be careful what you put out into this world, make it a better place. And that's what I'm going to leave you with. That's nice. Very nice. You're awesome. Very nice. I like that. And if anyone listening would like to join a conversation on social media with Clarence and Lee and myself, you are invited to join the Discussing Network Facebook group. Just go to groups or just go to Facebook and search for Discussing Network and you'll see our group. And we would be glad to have you join in on the conversation. We talk everything from Doctor Who to Star Trek to Anything in between Black Mirror, we've talked about Game of Thrones, so anything, comic books, everything. So join us. We'll have fun. And with that, we welcome you back next time because we will be back next time. You've been listening to the Discussing Network. Find out more at DiscussingNetwork.com. Discussing Who is brought to you by Audible. You've probably heard of Audible, but just in case, they are the world's leading provider of audiobooks. They have more than 180,000 titles. Let me say that again. 180,000 titles to choose from. Imagine a genre, they've got an audiobook. And these files play on smartphones, Kindles, tablets, in fact, over 500 different devices. Now, for fans of Discussing Who, Audible is offering a free download when you start a new Audible subscription. And you can choose anything at all from that vast library. But we know you want to get one of their absolutely fantastic Doctor Who titles, which include New Adventures of the Doctor, but also Torchwood and River Song. And they're performed for you by actors you know and love. Wonderful voices, Tom Baker, Alex Kingston, David Tennant. The list goes on and on. So try it out for 30 days. And if at the end of the month you decide Audible is not for you, you still get to keep that Doctor Who book you downloaded. So look at it this way. Free Doctor Who book. So here's how you get started. Point your favorite web browser to audibletrial.com slash discussing who. That's audible trial, all one word, A-U-D-I-B-L-E-T-R-I-A-L dot com slash discussing who. Also one word. And that's how you get your free book. What could be better than that?